so one well-known evangelistic track begins with these words, God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life, which is true. But if God has a wonderful plan for my life, why are we always trying to figure out what it is? Why does God not just tell us what the plan is? I mean, as you heard in my testimony, when I was in seminary, I did not come, uh, set out to come to Tyndale or even the Netherlands. There were a series of decisions that I had to make along the way that ultimately led me and led my family here. And I would imagine that my story isn't, I've talked to a number of you actually, that to find out my story isn't different um, than some of yours. Some of you came to Tyndale from a ministry position and had a very clear idea of what you plan to do um, to return to after you were at Tyndale. But maybe in the last two to three years, things have changed. Um, so things are not so clear as you think about graduating and going back home. Or maybe you came to Tyndale and you had no idea what you were gonna do after you uh, finished. And now the time has come to make a decision. And so you're asking yourself, what is God's will for my life? Now, when we think about God's will, we can have a lot of misperceptions about it. We can think of God's will like a maze where we have to constantly discern what the right decision is to stay on course with the goal of getting out of the maze or, or meaning that we've followed God's entire plan for our lives. We can also think of God like a, a magician or a, someone at a carnival where he has three cups and he puts the ball under and mixes it around and we have to somehow guess which, uh, which, where his will is in that. Or maybe God has chosen a number between one and 10, and we have to guess which number he has chosen, which signifies his will. And we think that if we guess his will wrong for our lives, we're gonna be punished or suffer consequences. But at minimum, God does not seem to make his will, make it easy for us to find his will. Now, when I, I present these three different scenarios, they sound kind of ridiculous in one sense. But on the other hand, that's, that's a little bit how we live, right? Um, those are some views, unspoken usually views we have of God's will. Um, God's will can be like a treasure hunt where we're, we're searching around for it, but we can never easily find it. And so when I consider these views of God's will about our quest to find out what future God has planned for us, I think of how they differ from Jesus's ministry. So Jesus heals a leper, and what does he tell him to go do? He says, go and show yourself to the priest. That's it. Then Jesus heals Jairus's daughter, and he's talking to Jairus um, and his wife. And he could have asked Jairus and his wife anything, right? I mean, he had a very captive audience right there. He could have asked them to swear loyalty to him, to become his disciples, to sell their home and give him all the money. But what does he do instead? He tells them to give their daughter something to eat. And that seems, when we think about it, that seems kind of like a waste of a captive audience, right? I mean, Jesus could have told them anything and they would have done it. But rather than a life plan, a five-year list of goals, Jesus gave them instructions about what to do next, and only next. So we're constantly seeking God's will for our lives when all God wants to tell us is what the next thing is. We struggle to make decisions because we want clear answers, and sometimes taking a big step feels like a risk, or it feels wasteful if we make the wrong one. We don't always live in a black and white world, which means that sometimes decisions are not right or wrong. Whether you take this job or that job, whether you live here or there, might not be right or wrong. Now again, to be clear here, I'm, not talking, I'm talking about non-moral decisions. Sometimes you might be considering a job and that job is asking you to lie or cheat or steal. And of course, those are not things that are in God's will. But there are times where taking one ministry position or a different ministry position is not right or wrong. And whether you live here or there, that's not a right or wrong answer to it. And I don't think these non-moral decisions are the most important things to God. And maybe that's something that's controversial to say. But I think our moral purity, our compassion, our joy, our witness, our faithfulness, our love, our worship, and faith are all more important to God than where I live. So what is God's will, though? So before I get into that, I want to mention two books that have been helpful kind of over the years. One that I read probably 
15 years ago by Kevin DeYoung called Just Do Something. Great, it's a small book, so it's about 100 pages. You can read it pretty quickly. Uh, and then another book is by Emily Freeman called The Next Right Thing, also great book. Um, so there's a lot of wisdom in them, and I'm gonna quote them in various places here. But back to the question about uh, what is God's will? Well, God's will is used different ways in scripture. So if you're in my Colossians class, you'll know that we talked about that God's will can be his plan of salvation, uh, where he sends his son into the world to save us from sin. He incorporates Jews and Gentiles into one people. It can also mean what he desires from his creatures, right? So specifically that we live holy lives, as Dr. Sandifer mentioned last week, our sanctification is God's will, uh, that we live in ways that please him. So that's another way scripture uses God's will. <laughs> It can also mean his will of decree or what he's um, ordained to happen, and that cannot be thwarted. It's immutable, it's fixed, right? The return of Jesus, the final judgment, those things will not change, they will come to pass. But when we're asking what God's will for my life is, usually what we're asking for is God's will of direction, or what I'm calling God's will of direction, his individual specific plan for the who, what, where, when, and how of my life. Now, the question is, does God have a secret will of direction that he expects us to figure out before we do anything? So when I have two decisions or two options, does God want me to figure out what his specific plan is before I make one of those decisions? The simple biblical answer to that is no. There is no place in scripture that demonstrates this. Yes, God works all things together for our good in Christ, and looking back, we will often be able to see God's hand in bringing us to where we are. So some of what I shared my testimony uh, last month was me doing that, seeing how God has used these things to bring me to where I am. But that doesn't mean I have to figure those things out ahead of time. After all, it would seem odd, I think, for God to have a specific plan for us, not tell us what it is, and then punish us if we choose the wrong thing. So I don't think that God has a secret will that we have to figure out before we make decisions. Now, it's, it's almost always looking back on our lives, we can see how the Lord led us to where we did. So before, uh, when Anna and I were dating and I was deciding whether I wanted to marry her, I didn't ask the question, is it God's will for me to marry her? What I asked is, as Dr. Bass shared, does she love the Lord? Is she in support of the ministry that I want to go into? Is she exhibiting the fruit of the Spirit? And the answer to those questions, obviously, were all yes, which is why I proposed. Amen. So, <laughs> but it's looking back now. I mean, there were other women that I had been interested in at different times, but looking back on it, I can see how the Lord led me to Anna and how we got together. But before we got married, the question isn't, is she the only person that God will be pleased that I marry? because I don't think that's the right question to ask. So I wanna to suggest to you that instead of focusing on God's plan for our lives, we should keep this in mind. This is from Freeman. You are one in whom Christ dwells. You live in an unshakable kingdom. The decision is rarely the point. What if the way we make decisions is equally as important as the decision itself? What if choice is one of the primary avenues of our spiritual formation? And we think God wants us to do something. Now he does, on the one hand, he wants us to faithfully serve him, he wants us to love others. But he also, and we kind of neglect this, he wants us to become the right person. And when we consider questions about the future, where a family should live, what job to take, we need to be reminded that God uses those decisions and he uses the way we make those decisions to grow and shape us into the people he desires us to be. So before I, I talk about how to make decisions or just some general advice on that, I want to pause and consider this question at least. So what drives our motivation to know the will of God? Now there's, I think, a bunch of different answers. The two I want to highlight here at least is I think fear and lack of trust drive that. And, and I'm not just criticizing any of you that I've talked to about this. I mean, it's true of me too, right? When I, I want to know what the right thing to do or what God's will is, it's usually because I'm afraid or I'm lacking trust. I fear that I will be out of God's will, miss his blessing. I fear the unknown and I want assurance that everything will go well for me and for those that I love. 
We fear that we will pick wrong, make the wrong decision. But doesn't it all come down to whether we trust God's provision and God's promise? So if we're not to search out and find God's will of direction for our lives, how do we go about making decisions? When faced with two different options, a ministry position here, a ministry position there, live here, live there, how do we decide? Well, when answers aren't clear, what I think we want is peace, clarity, and a nudge in the right direction. And so I'm here to give you a few ways of hopefully finding the nudge in the right direction. Now, some of this advice is very ordinary and mundane because the reality is special revelation was and is rare and unique, right? When God appears to you in a dream, uh, when we read about that in the Bible, that's the exception. That's not the rule. Um, I'm not saying it can't happen. I think God can do that, but he doesn't always. Usually the way we make decisions is pretty ordinary and straightforward. So the first thing when I think about how we make decisions, this one's probably obvious, but we should seek first God's kingdom. Matthew 6, 25 says, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? And then I'm going to skip down. Therefore do not be anxious saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things and your heavenly Father knows you need them. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. So Jesus doesn't want us to worry about the future. Right? He, he says that he will provide everything we need to live and glorify him in this life until we die. So the first thing we need to do is follow his commands, his glory, but mostly follow him. Being in God's will is not a, a plan for our lives. It's a daily decision to seek God's kingdom rather than our own kingdom. That's, that's what it is. So the first thing to do is seek his kingdom. Do the things that scripture plainly tells us to do. The second, I think, know yourself. Know what you love. And I don't, don't just mean the normal Christian answers about loving God, loving his word, loving your family. Those are obviously all things that you should love. But know how God has gifted you. Know what you enjoy doing. Take time to admit things that you long for. Ask yourself why you want to do certain things. Is it because of expectations of parents or spouse? Is it a desire for fame, reputation, comfort? If you don't ask yourself these questions, you still have decisions to make, um, but you may make decisions not based on self-awareness, but on outward things like expectations or habit or some other external pressure. Also know what you value and what's important to you. And again, I don't mean the Bible and Jesus. That's obviously, I hope that you value both of those things. But what is essential? Don't consider what is productive, profitable, impressive, or expected, but Consider what things are essential to you. So when Anna and I were thinking through places to overseas to serve, uh, what, 10 years ago or 12 years ago at this point, we came up with a list of three things that we valued. Number one, a place where I could teach the Bible in a classroom versus just kind of traveling out to the country or to the bush and, and teaching the Bible, but teaching it in a formal setting. Uh, a place, the second was a place where mentoring and discipleship were valued. And then third was a place where Anna could contribute to the ministry I was involved in so that we could partner together in ministry. Now that short list actually helps sort things through for us quite a bit. So um, Anna and I, and then Luke, when he was four months old, we traveled to a country in Asia to check out uh, a ministry opportunity. So this was eight, nine years ago at this point. Um, I would, at this place, I would have the opportunity to teach. I would be able to likely mentor students, but I would have to travel quite a bit. Um, and Anna would not be able to come with me for a variety of reasons. Uh, now, God never appeared to us in a dream to tell us not to take that opportunity. But actually, even one of the things that happened with that trip is we developed this, these kind of three things that we value. And we realized, uh, I mean, again, God didn't appear to us in a dream. We didn't have, there was no supernatural thing, but we used wisdom. We thought through what we valued and decided that it was not the place for us. And so we said no. Again, looking back, I can see that was not God's will for us. 
But at the time, I think if I would have said yes to it, it's not that God would have punished us or been mad at us. Also, for someone else, that opportunity might have been great. There's nothing right or wrong about it. There's nothing right or wrong about Anna and I wanting to do ministry together. Um, some spouses, some you know, marriages, uh, a wife has a ministry she wants to be involved in, and a husband has a different ministry he wants to be involved in, and that's totally fine. That's, that's a specific decision for each, each couple or each family to make. But for us, these were our three values, and they shaped how we looked through different ministry opportunities. So think through what you value and whether opportunities fit that. So if you value ministry together as a family, but a ministry is going to require you to travel a lot without your wife and kids, perhaps that's not the best fit for you. So third, then, seek counsel from others, particularly those outside of the situation that don't really have a stake in the matter. Right? It, when you ask someone their advice and it, it affects them, they're going to obviously give you a, a certain kind of answer. They're going to have some bias. But I firmly believe God guides us in our decision making. And one of the, the ways he does that is through listening to the counsel of others. Proverbs tells us to seek wisdom. And one of the ways Proverbs tells us to seek wisdom is through talking to other people and talking, in, in our case, to other Christians. The question we want to ask is, are you, are you willing to change your mind if someone presents a case that has more merit than yours? So talk to the no, those who know you well, who know your abilities, your skills, what you like, what you don't like. And they can help you think through whether this job or ministry or whatever it might be would seem like a good fit given your interests, your training, and your qualifications. Now, again, there are times where you may decide contrary to the advice of others. That does happen. I mean... My parents aren't thrilled <laughs> that my family moved overseas. So that was a decision I made contrary to what they wanted. Um, but sometimes the goal is not to please others. And sometimes you need to make unpopular decisions because that's the right thing. Um, but you still want to seek counsel from other people. I have a friend um, back in the US who I talk to when I need to make a decision about things. He knows me very well. He knows what I'm good at, things that I enjoy, and he also thinks through issues really well. He always gives me questions to consider. He doesn't just tell me what to do, but he'll ask me questions about different opportunities or different situations I'm considering. And, and they're really helpful, thoughtful questions for me to think through. Um, and at the end of the and he can also, he has no, no problem sharing if he thinks something is a good or bad idea. So he's honest with me. Now, Anna's the same way with that, so I'm thankful for many reasons that she's who I married. But these are the kind of people that you want in your life to be able to talk to about these things. So that's third. Fourth, this one's pretty obvious, but pray. Now, what I mean by that is I'm not saying do not put out a fleece. I know Gideon put out a fleece in the book of Judges. <laughs> But in the context of the book of Judges, if you read it, that was actually a faithless thing for Gideon to do. So it was not something that judges, that the author endorses. Actually, he kind of criticizes it. Um, I'm not saying God, so God condescends to Gideon and answers. So I'm not saying if you put out a fleece that God will never answer it. But it's not the best idea, I don't think, to be honest. Um, yeah, I, I think it can be a way of testing the Lord, which the Bible generally discourages, of course. So I think when we pray, I'm saying we pray for insight and for wisdom. God can give us insight into our motives, whether something fits well with our values. You can pray that God would give you good motives. Pray for humility and attitude of trust and faith. Pray that God would help keep you honest, reveal things about you that would help you decide about a ministry position. Pray that you would see a true picture of this, this school, this church, whatever it might be. Pray that they would see a good picture of you so that, to see if uh, you'd be a good fit for this. Pray that you would not be motivated by fear or by pride. So these are all ways to pray through decisions. Fifth is do something today. So what is the next right thing you can do today? Because when we think about it, that's all we can do anyway, right? You can only do one thing at a time. You don't need a five-year plan. I, I know from talking to you, you have plenty of assignments to work on today. <laughs> so that's probably part of the next thing to do. But while you're thinking about the future, while you're, you have assignments to do, 
Maybe it entails doing research on something. So if there's a church you might be interested, look into that church, go to their website. That's something you can do now before you need to make a decision. If you're considering school after this, look into programs that you're interested in. Again, you don't have to make the decision now, but start looking into those things. So think of what you can do right now. So again, you don't need a five-year plan. God's word is a great quote I love that I found. God's word is a lamp unto your feet, not your football field. <laughs> right? He shows you the next step, not the whole thing. So when a decision comes, what do I do? Well, as I've said, I think whether it matches my values, my abilities. I know myself reasonably well at this point, so I know if something is a good fit for me. I pray for insight, I seek advice, and then I make a decision. And I don't over-spiritualize it. I usually don't say, God told me to do this, because that, that's not always true, for one thing. What I want you to know, and what I hope will release some pressure from you, is God loves you. He wants your good. And we make our decisions, and we choose our next steps, but we get scared when we can't see the future. What if we chose to finally believe that our steps are leading somewhere good? As we make plans, do the, the things that need doing, may we remember still to remain open to surprise. Instead of insisting on clear plans, may we be willing to settle in and take the next right step, even though it may lead someplace we didn't quite pack for. I'm gonna pray for you um, along these lines. Lord, you told Abraham to leave his country, his people, and his father's household. But you did not tell him exactly where he was going. You told Moses to lead the people out of Egypt, but you did not give him a five-week plan. You told Mary she would have a son and call him Jesus, but she was not offered assurance of his safety or guarantees that her life would go smoothly. You are not a God who offers clear steps. But you invited Abraham outside and told him to look up at the stars. So shall your offspring be. You gave Moses a vision of a promised land flowing with milk and honey. You whispered salvation for the whole world in Mary's ear. You never promised clarity, but you always give a hopeful vision. And you always always promise your presence. You say that I will go with you wherever you go. Do not be afraid. And so Lord, may you be with us in our fear. May we learn more about who we are and the decisions before us. May we see how the, the process of even making decisions transforms us more into the image of your son. Lord, because we wanna be more like him. So Lord, help relieve us of pressure. Give us peace as we decide about the future. Give us clarity about what the next right step is. And Lord, remind us always of your presence with us. And it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.